Hey you folks, Quilly Dean here, and welcome to another episode of our Unity 2D Space Shooter tutorial. Relatively simple, classic, arcadey space shooter. Unfortunately, we still don't shoot. We're getting pretty close. We can steer around, we can bump into things, we lose a hit point. If we bump into something else, that'll be enough to kill us. And uh, if we hit spacebar, we want to be able to shoot. Now, we've kind of started that last time. We've got the basic uh, structure of the script, our player shooting script, which has been added to our player ship. No, I'm lying to you. It hasn't been, so let's make sure to add that in there. And uh, in fact, let's go ahead and add a little debug command so we know it's it's working. Pew! And let's go back over here. Hit space. If ever anything doesn't work, add some of those debug commands in. Figure out what your program is actually doing. So now if I hit, if I hold the space bar every quarter second, because that's what I got my fire delay set to, every quarter second, we will pew. Excellent. Now, we actually want to shoot. We want to fire a bullet. So what does that mean? Well, what we're going to have to do <clears throat> is instantiate a copy of a prefab. Lots of words going on there, but we're going to be okay. First, let's start off. We've got our bullet sprite. We defined it earlier. Let's go ahead and gra uh, grab a copy of that in the game. This is the thing that we're going to shoot. It's this little, like, laser beam. Whoa, don't do that. If you grab the edge, what you're doing is you're, you're scaling. So just Control-Z to undo it and leave our scale at 1. Um, and let's see if we can move it. There we go. So we're going to be shooting this thing out of the nose of our ship. Looks pretty good, actually. Very nice and glowy. Looks good in the dark background. Love it. So what we're going to do is we need to somehow tell this script to create a copy of this bullet whenever we shoot. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this bullet, first of all. Well, we're going to do a few things to it. Uh, actually, before we even start shooting it, we're going to make it act very bullety. So let me grab this guy, move it right over here. So our bullet needs to do a few things. First of all, clearly... It needs to bump into objects, and we know what that means at this point. We know it needs a rigid body 2D set to is kinematic, because we're not using the actual physics collisions. We just want to detect triggers. Oh, triggers. Hey, let's put a box collider on this thing. We're going to come back and try different colliders on these things later on, but box colliders will be a good start. And this box collider is going to be a trigger. Again, we're not using real physics, but this will be enough for them to detect when they bump into each other. Uh, and you know what? The bullet probably... When it hits something, it should probably stop, right? It should be a one-shot thing. If it hits something, the bullet will then go away. So let's give it a damage handler where it can take a point of damage there. We're going to get, um, we're going to have to set it on a layer. I'm going to leave it on, no, we'll go ahead. I'm going to set it to the player layer for now. We're going to assume this is a player bullet. So this means it can bump into enemies. It will do a point, at, they'll both trigger. When the bullet runs into the enemy, they'll both trigger. The enemy will take a point of damage. The bullet will take a point of damage. The bullet only has one hit point. It will go away. This enemy here only has one hit point, so it will go away. If it was an enemy with more hit points, it wouldn't die instantly. It would take the hit, and then that would be it. Um, the other thing I just realized is my invulnerability code is affecting enemies as well, so I don't want that. Hold on a sec. Um, we want a public float called... Um, uh, well, it's basically like invuln uh, period, I guess. And what am I, what am I using a half second? Well, we'll have it default to zero. My invulnerability timer. Sorry, I just realized there was a glitch. Well, not a glitch, but it would have allowed the enemies to have an invulnerability period, which I don't want. I only want the player to have a half second invulnerability period after the player takes damage. So now the bullet can intersect the enemy. Let, let's go ahead and test. If I'm going to hit play... The bullet doesn't move, which is, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. But if I go and manually move it into the enemy, boop, excellent. Bullet kills someone. So obviously the bullet is missing some sort of script that causes it to move forward. Well, hell, let's create a script called move forward. Move forward. Well, this is going to be pretty easy, right? We can, in fact, copy some of the code from our player. So we don't need a start, we just need an update. Once per frame, we want to move the play, this, this bullet forward. Well, if we go to the player, the player movement script, well, we know we've got the move the ship. Well, we're going to do the same thing. Copy this, paste it over here. The uh, speed, oh, max speed, that's a good idea. Let's set float, max speed. We'll go and just hard code something in for now. Let's say a speed of 5. That's fine. 
Oh, we need a rotation. Well, of course, doesn't that make sense? The, the bullet will not always be heading straight up, so it needs to know what its current rotation is. Well, we could stuff it in a variable, but let's just grab our transform.rotation, multiply that by the correct velocity, and now, because we there's this bullet has no way to rotate, it should just move forward all the time. No matter which way it's pointing, it'll move in what is theoretically the correct forward for that. But it's easy to imagine that we could have a bullet that is like a heat-seeking missile, which will try to turn towards the closest enemy. We'll look into that a little bit more in a second. Now, if it play, the bullet should move on its own. Uh, I'm wrong because I forgot to add the move forward script to the bullet. And actually, let's go and take this bullet and move it down a little bit. All right, let's hit play. Uh, oh. Transform.position equals pause. There we go. Oh, come on. This is just getting silly. Now what am I forgetting to do? Uh, max speed equals 5 multiplied by max. Oh, we're checking the axis. Derp. Look, look I'll show you. Now, right now, it's uh, the bullet is controlled by, the, uh, by my joystick, which is not what I want. I'll just get rid of that. So now it's just going to be max speed times time to delta time. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So you can see the bullet moves forward. If I go and I take this bullet, for example, uh, and I bring it over here and then rotate it 90 degrees against around the Z. Oh, negative 90 degrees. And hit play. It should move towards the right. Boom. Excellent. Everything works. Okay, I'll unrotate it here. And, um, all right, so we have a functional bullet. Now, what we want to do is get the player to shoot this. So what we're going to have to do is take this bullet and drag it over to the right and turn it into a prefab. This is a reference we can then copy. I can then delete the original one, which is now in blue. And so we've got this bullet. I can, I can drag it in. I can make multiple bullets. Actually, if I do this and then I hit, the first bullet should kill the first enemy. The second bullet should go and kill the second enemy. Ooh, that's interesting. Oh, they're moving so fast, they both hit the same enemy in the same frame. Is that, is that good? Is it bad? I, I don't know. I mean, they both definitely triggered. If this enemy, so if I do this, right? If we have these bullets that go side by side, basically. We're firing twin, twin, twin guns. If they both hit this enemy, if it had two hit points, it would have hit it twice and killed it. But the fact that it only has one hit points, they still both trigger against the same guy because he takes that one frame to die. But maybe that's good. Sometimes that's by design. These are the sorts of things that kind of evolve as part of the gameplay design. It's not necessarily bad. If I just move this guy over to the side this way, only one of them should hit. It's working as built. Whether it's as intended, I don't know. That's up to you guys. All right, let's go and delete these bullets. So now that we have this, we can create as many copies of this as we want, including in our script. So if we go back to our player shooting script, we don't need this move forward anymore. Uh, actually, we don't need anything right now except for player shooting here's what we need we need public game object reference to our bullet prefab we need that then we're going to make a copy of it so first let's um well here's the thing i was gonna say let's make an error check but we don't need an error check the game will tell us quite loudly if we forget to do something which i will intentionally do right now i will forget to do something so we've decided we're shooting we're doing a pew we reset our, our cooldown timer so what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate a copy of the bullet prefab. Now, if I just do this version of instantiate, it will create the bullet prefab at the coordinates that are in the prefab itself. So negative 0.6 and a y of 1.2, which often in these prefabs, I do set them to zero. So this would have one right in the middle. But we don't want the bullet to show up in the middle. We want the bullet to show up, well, basically where the player is, but slightly ahead. All right, how do we do that? Well... It's not hard at all. So if we just wanted the bullet to show up exactly where the player is, we can so you use the other version of instantiate where you feed it a position. So transform that position. This is the player's position. And it also needs a rotation in that case. Well, wouldn't it make sense to give it the player's rotation as well? And if we see, if we do this, it'll sort of work. Oh, actually, that's really weird that it, it goes into the stall. It, it will give me an error in a second. And the reason is we haven't instantiated the bullet prefab, but it should, and it's kind of weird to do this thing, at least on my computer. There we go. 
where it'll sort of stall for a while when trying to do it. But there's your ultimate error. Unassigned reference, the variable bu bullet prefab has not been assigned. And you're like, oh, right, of course, bullet prefab here. But if I go to my player ship and I check my component, bullet prefab, none. We've got to assign it to something, which you can do with either the circle over here and click on bullet, or you can drag it in from the project view. Now, if we hit play and hit the space bar, pew, 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 pew. There we go. We've got a whole stream of bullets. So a few problems. First of all, I don't know if you noticed, but when we shoot, the bullet comes from the middle of our ship. And the reason is we are setting the bullet's original coordinates to the coordinates of our ship, which is this bit right over here. So it's centered right on that bit. The other thing is you might notice in the hierarchy over here, uh, the bullets never go away. They just keep living forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and go into space forever and ever. And eventually, you would have thousands upon thousands of bullets in space taking up your processor time. So clearly, we need to do a few changes. First of all, let's have these bullets clean themselves up. My favorite way to do this is I like to have a script called self-destruct. And I'm going to go ahead and drag it onto the bullet prefab. So now the bullet prefab has a self-destruct script. And if I go into here, this script's job is simply to kill itself. We're going to create a um, public float um, called timer, maybe. I'll have it default to one second. Actually, no. This will be sort of a self-cleanup. We'll have it five seconds. That, way more than enough time needed to get off the screen, but not so much of time that it's going to cause a problem. So after five seconds, actually, we'll set it to one second for testing. It'll be great. After one second, it'll just kill itself. Now, there's two ways you can do this. One, you can say you can use the destroy function with game object and actually pass it a timer. After one second, the object will self-destruct. Personally, though, I like to manage it myself. And the reason for that is... Um, if I have some sort of pause function or, or I want to be able to override that destruct, I'll be able to do it. So instead, what I do is in the update, I go timer minus equal time the delta time. If timer is less than or equal to zero, then, uh, then at that point, we destroy ourselves. Destroy game object. So I just like that little extra bit of manual control. So now our bullet, our bullet prefab, has that self-destruct after one second, but it's public, we can change the amount of time. Let's go see how that looks. If we zoom out, we can actually see, if I've got the camera selected, I can see the area that is my screen, and we'll start shooting. Uh, it's hard to see the bullet. Oh, it's actually the way the time, oh, of course, it's moving at a speed of one, and right now it's got a position of five tile, or it's moving at a speed of five, and it's five units from the screen. So if I do this, there we go. So it lasts for a second, which is clearly not long enough. So let's go and stop, go to our bullet prefab, and go ahead and give it five seconds of life, which at its current speed is enough to move 25 units, which is way bigger than the size of the screen. You can see they still live after they get off the screen, but they do die at some point and that's fine. The other thing I could do is I could have a script, instead of doing a timer thing, I could have it die when it leaves the boundaries of the screen. That's okay. This was just a little bit simpler. Now if we turn, pew, 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 we can kill all the aliens. Excellent. And it actually starting to look pretty good, except for the fact that the bullets come out of the middle of the ship, which is no good. Also, it just so happens the bullets go at the exact same speed as our ship, which looks a little bit weird. So let's go ahead on our bullets. We'll make them a little bit faster, just slightly faster than our ship. So now if we fire and we're sort of moving towards it. Um, no, what? Oh, that's the timer. Derp, derp. Um, oh, moves forward. I actually don't have a public variable for that. That's no good. So let's make the max speed here public. So now in our bullet, there we go, we'll set it, well maybe we'll set it to 8. Back up, fire, and then move forward. There we go. That looks okay. It's still not coming out of the right place of the ship though. So there's a few different things you can do. You can go into your prefab or your ship here. We could add an empty child, call it something like, um, you know, gun spot take it move it to where we might want to spawn and in our script we can look for this gun spot and use that um, which is a great way to do it especially if you got multiple guns like you might want to take comment left and right i think for our purposes we can go real simple when we instantiate our bullet prefab over here instead of using our current position what we're going to do vector three we'll use a placeholder uh, graph uh, variable again we're going to set it to our current position 
Um, no, we're going to create some sort of offset. Sorry, I'm getting a blinky thing in the corner of my screen. Uh, Steam, go away. I don't want to update right now. Bye-bye. Um, we want an offset based on our current rotation. So instead, all right, here's a, probably the most verbose way of doing it. We want a forward offset. We want to shoot, we want to put the bullet slightly ahead of our, our ship, maybe a half a unit. So something like new vector, we want to set it by default. You got to think of it as the Y because the Y we're sort of treating as our forward like this, okay? Half a unit forward in the Y direction, which works great if we're facing straight up, but usually we're rotated. So let's consider that. We're going to take our ship's transform.rotation multiply it by this vector so now no matter how we our ship is rotated around our offset will be a half a unit ahead of us so now instead of spawning directly on our ship's position let's add in our offset how does that look Nah, see now that looks a lot more reasonable now you may or may not want to hard code in this sort of position but there's options. The other thing you could do is uh, you could you could have it as a public vector uh, bullet offset. Uh, and I think we can have it default to a vector like this. I think this works. Save. Oh, semicolon. So now, if we look at our player ship and we check the player shooting, you can see there's a bullet offset in the inspector that we can change. So now, if, I, if we want fine-tuning it, we can do it that way. And again, there's always the possibility of doing child objects and things, but I don't think I want to, you know, manipulate the hierarchy in uh, this little tutorial. Okay, we're shooting bullets. Excellent. Uh, actually, really, really excellent. But isn't it a little unfair that the enemies can't shoot back? I think we can both agree that that is insanely uh, unfair. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go, I'm going to get rid of one of these enemies and delete it. Now this enemy over here, I'm going to start giving it a little bit of life. So let's think about how these enemies may behave. Again, it depends very much on the kind of game you're making. I think in this game, where our player can sort of roam around an enclosed area, I think rather than following a fixed pattern, I'm going to have this enemy try to chase the player. It's going to try to turn towards the player, probably not very quickly, give the player lots of chance to dodge out of the way. It's going to try to turn towards the player, and it's going to shoot when it's vaguely facing towards the player, it will start shooting. I think that's pretty good behavior. So let's not deal with the actual movement. Let's deal with how it might turn to face the player. I think that's an excellent question. So let's create a new script. We're going to call it faces player. It's not a very general script, but for our purposes, it's going to be good. Let's go ahead and apply that to our enemy and open that bad boy up. So the very first question you should be asking yourself is, uh, how does the enemy know which game object is the player? That's a great, great question. Ultimately, it's going to want to track the transform of the player. Now, we could make this a public, in which case we'd be able to simply drag the player ship into there. And that would be sufficient. The reason this is not exactly a good idea is because it's probably a good uh, expectation to think the player might have more than one life. So if the player is destroyed, he can respawn, will spawn a new player ship. And the act of destroying the player ship will break this connection. So it'll no longer be valid. So this is not the right way to do things. I think. I believe. So we don't want it to be a public. Instead, we want the enemy to be responsible for finding the player on its own. So how are we going to do that? We could do it in the start, but again, when the player dies, even if we've successfully, you know, we found player equals blah, 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 right? Even if we've, if we've done that successfully, if the player dies and then respawns, this player link will no longer be valid. So what I like to do is in the update, I like to put in a little if player equals null. Okay, this means we've either just started, we've never had a player, or maybe we had a player reference, but the player has since died. If player is equal to null, then we need to find the player's ship. Now there's a bunch of different ways to do this. One way you can do it is if your player has a tag that we can search for, like the player tag, you can find things like that. Now the problem with the tag is tags are not necessarily unique. You would use a game object dot find with tag and it will return the first thing it finds, but 
I don't like it. It feels weird to me. I don't know why. Maybe it's a stupid thing. But I, I don't particularly like it. I, for whatever reason, actually prefer object.find by name, which is currently playership. I have no idea. I just, I don't like tags. I don't use them. I use layers and I use object names. And anyway, that's just, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that's the way I do it. So we're going to try to find an object called playership. Now, technically, this returns a game object. What we actually want is the transform. It doesn't really matter. I could actually just do, you know, something like this instead. But for the sake of argument, what we're caring about is the transform, because the transform specifically points to an instance in the world as opposed to a game object, which can also point to prefabs and various things like this. So we're going to try to find something called playership. Then we're going to say, if game object not equals null, because it's possible that we failed to find anything called playership. Maybe the player is currently respawning, you know, currently dead. We're playing an explosion, and three seconds from now, the player will be back in the game. So if it's not null, then player is going to be equal to the game object's transform. And we've got it. Otherwise, um, you could put in else, but the else would just be, well, player doesn't exist right now. Uh, pfft, do nothing, I guess. So we're going to do this. So now, at this point, we've either found the player or he, she doesn't exist right now. So if the player at this point, player, why isn't auto-completing? I don't know. If player is equal to null at this point, let's just get the hell out. Let's just end. Try, oops, try again, next frame. We'll look for the player every frame. But at this point here, we know for sure we have a player. Turn to face it. Turn to to, turn to face it. Okay, now we get to a place that's a little bit of a deficiency in the Unity 2D system. If this were in 3D space, we could use this cool little quaternion dot uh, look rotation, which allows us to specify a direction we want to look in, and this would give us the correct rotation to look at that direction. So what we can do, for example, is vector 3, so deer, that's the direction to the player, will be the uh, player dot position minus our transform dot position. Is that right? If the player at 0, 0, and we're at 0, if we're at 10, 0, then this would return negative 10, which is correct because it's negative 10 in the X. Okay, I always have to do this sort of like mental check. So this will be, if we took our current position and added deer to it, we would be literally on top of the player. So this should basically point to the player. And again, if we were in 3D space, we could do quaternion dot look rotation in the direction of the player. And this would give us the correct rotation for that. However, there's a couple of different reasons we can't do that. One, we don't want to rotate around anything other than the Z axis because things can be really weird. If I pop into the 3D view over here and I take our enemy ship, so if I rotate around the Z, that's clearly what we want. If I rotate around the Y or the X, no, we no, none of that should be happening in 2D space. That's, that's all kinds of bad. Um, and so that will often happen with uh, the quaternion.look rotation. Now I could then go and freeze those after the fact, but the problem is, Another problem is, by default, the forward direction in an object that you would look at is along the z-axis, which is clearly wrong. We want our look to be... Actually, I just realized, is this ship facing the right way? Like, what's the forward part of the ship here? I didn't rotate it, so the player ship was facing up this way. Is it just me, or does this seem like the window? Like, this looks like the ship is facing to the south, right? Yeah. So we ran into a funny little problem here. Sorry, sorry to, uh, to sidestep. But I don't like the fact that the ship looks like it's facing down because I want positive Y to be the forward direction. That's how I'm treating it. Positive Y is how I am treating the forward direction in our game. And right now it looks the wrong way. So what I could do is I can rotate it 180. Now, yeah, now it looks like it's pointing up, but it's pointing up with a rotation, which was going to lead to all kinds of trouble. Here's what we're going to do. This is a very, very common thing. We are going to take um, what we're going to do. Our enemy here, we're going to remove the sprite renderer from the object itself. It's crazy talk. Bear with me. It's fine. 
we're going to remove the sprite render from this enemy. So now it still exists. It still has a collision box. It still behaves exactly like it used to. We just can't see it. Then I'm going to take the enemy graphic and drop it inside of this enemy. And I'm going to take that and center it. Okay. So now we've got our enemy object. And then we've got the thing called, I don't know, um, graphics. Okay. I'm going to take this graphic and I'm going to rotate this one 180 degrees. Now our parent object is not rotated, but it looks like it's facing north. It looks like it's facing up, which is exactly what I want. So that is a very common thing when you need to do a rotation or a scale. Like if it wasn't quite the right size, I could go ahead and like change the size of things here without affecting any of the weird, without needing to set a scale on the base object. There's, you know, little things, whoa, little things like that you can do. So that I'm much happier with these graphics facing this way. I think that's exactly what I want. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, the code. So we know the direction. So how do we face this? Knowing that we, there's not an equivalent 2D, which is a little bit of a thing. Unfortunately, and I hate to do this to you guys, we have to use a wee bit of math. So first of all, this direction is not just a direction. It is like a, a, a vector, it's a distance is really what it is. It's a distance vector. We want the direction to be normalized. We wanna make sure this vector is, has a size of one just so that all the rest of the math is good. So we're just gonna go and normalize this. This means that like, so if we were directly to the right, so imagine the player's at zero, zero, and we're at an X of 10, a Y of zero. So we're 10 units to the right. So this right now, the direction would be negative 10. By normalizing it, it sets it to a vector of negative one comma zero comma zero. Just make sure the length of the vector is one. Then we're gonna do <clears throat> float the, uh, the Z angle that we need requires that we use arctan2 direction dot x no sorry direction dot y direction dot x this will return a radian that is the correct angle based on our x and y we want it to be in degrees so we have to multiply it by rad2 degree so now we have that except by default, all this math assumes that the sort of zero angle is along the um, along the x-axis. So after all this, we then have to give it a 90 degree turn so that it's actually facing, um, the, the, so a default, a zero angle is facing straight up because in normal math coordinate system, a zero angle would face directly towards the right. So we're doing, um, or actually, I think in our coordinate system, this might actually be facing towards the left normally. So anyway, we're giving a 90 degree twist, so it's facing up. I think I got that right. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry we have to involve a little bit of math. I feel terrible. So then what we're going to do is we're going to set a rotation. Right now, we're going to immediately set a rotation based on this Z angle. So our transform dot rotation is going to be equal to a new quaternion using Euler angles because quaternions are hard going to have an x of zero, a y of zero, and the z angle is going to be this. Let's give this a try. This should enable, we've got the script, faces players, this should cause the enemy to always face the player. Boop, and it does, like that. Now, right now, the enemy instantly turns to face the player. This is probably not what we want. We probably don't want an enemy that's quite that quick, especially say, let's say we're directly behind uh, let's go back to 2D view. There we go. Let's say we are directly behind the enemy here. How long should it take for the enemy to rotate around? Right now it's instant, but the player doesn't rotate instantly, so that's not fair. So, in our faces player script, let me go and get rid of some of these. In our faces player script, we're going to give it, just like the player, we're going to give it a float, which is going to be the rotation speed. And we'll give it a rotation speed of, I don't know, 180 degrees a second. Seems reasonable. So, instead of setting the rotation directly. So we're going to do, we're going to do quaternion dot uh, desired uh, rotation is going to be that. And then there's a quaternion function called rotate towards. We're going to rotate from our current rotation to our desired rotation. And then we give it how many degrees we're allowed to rotate right now. And the answer to that will be our rotation speed times time 
dot delta time. And we're going to set our transform dot rotation to be equal to this. So now we should only rotate at a rate of 180 degrees per second. So let's hit play. And it works. Let me check my enemy, make sure it doesn't, it's not accidentally rotating against the X or Y. And it's not. So we'll do this. I mean, it still rotates pretty quickly, but technically it's not instant. We might want to slow it down though. I think this is probably a good time. Let's set a default of something like 90. Save that. And then make it public. Whoops. And don't accidentally tap things. So now, oh yeah, see, because of the order I did things in. So let's go ahead and change this to 90 degrees. Or maybe we can even make it 45 degrees. These would be apocalyptically slow. Oh, that's way too slow. Like old man slow. 90 degrees. All right, that's not bad. Once it locks on, I mean, you'd have to do a pretty close buzz, but it's then it starts to become possible to maybe avoid it. And this is going to become really, really obvious. Let's take our enemy. Let's give it the move forward script. Ah, let's slow it down. Let's give it a speed of three. Let's see what happens here. So now it's trying to chase the player. It's a very dumb sort of chase the player. But this is, this is exactly the right sort of behavior for this sort of game. With just one, it's easy for the player to avoid it and shoot it. Now, what happens if there's more than one of these guys? Well, first of all, let's go and make this enemy a prefab. And then let's organize our project a little bit because I hate this. We're going to go prefabs. We're going to put our bullet and our enemy in there. We're going to make another folder. Scripts. Put all our scripts in there. And then we're going to go and create another folder for graphics. And we're going to put a sprite sheet in there. Ah, so much better. And yeah, I forgot to mention a couple of videos when I created the scene. I always create like the dummy scene so I can actually save things. That was bad of me. All right, so now we've got our enemy prefab. And I'm going to go ahead and just create an extra few copies of this guy. So now let's see the player dodge all this. Now, if they run into the player, they will do damage. If the player gets hit twice, he will die. Oh, there you go. I got clipped once already. Notice that they do not bump into one another. I don't like that. I, even without shooting, I already failed to, uh, to stay alive. Now, part of the issue is that our hitboxes are not pixel perfect. What am I talking about? Let's zoom in on our player over here. This green outline, that's our hitbox. Which means if an enemy or a stray bullet happened to pass through this area over here, that would technically hit us. Would that feel good? If you're a player, would that feel good? Probably not. It's made worse by the fact that the enemy also has a whoops, square hitbox around it. Why can't I move you? The enemy also has a square hitbox around it, which gives us a little bit of an extra edge there too. So it becomes quite likely, in fact. So the, in this situation right here, these two units would be colliding. Does that feel good? No. That, that would be awful. So let's not do that. So we have to talk about our hitbox size at this point before we uh, get the enemy to start shooting at us. So how do we want our collision to work? Clearly a box is wrong. Well, I say that. Different games do this with different ways. There are some like old school or some, some hard mode, hardcore kind of shmups, shoot 'em ups where the hitbox is basically just the very tiny center of your ship. On your player, anyway. The other hitboxes are a little bit bigger. But your player ship is a tiny little thing, which is interesting because you can actually, like, clip the edges of your graphic against things, and you're okay. That might be fine. In which case, honestly, keep using a box glider. Just make it tiny. Like, 0.1, 0.1 in size. And then move it down a little bit. Right? So something like that. There. There's our collider. That can work. The advantage of box gliders is they're very, very, very fast. Also, the player doesn't really care if, um, if he should have gotten hit by like grazing the corner or something and he doesn't die. That's something that does not feel bad. In fact, it often feels fine and right and you won't even notice. Um, and then it becomes kind of a design feature. But having a hitbox that's too large feels not good when you're playing. A, it, it, you're not happy about it, but also it feels wrong, it feels sloppy. Whereas this, oddly enough, does not feel wrong and sloppy. Very bizarre kind of thing. But obviously a box glider can only take us so far. What other options do we have for colliders? Let's remove this component. Well, if we go Collider and then we type in 2D, just to see all the, the 2D colliders. There's Circle Collider. If we hit this, 
Now, a circle collider is also extremely quick, very quick, potentially even quicker than a box collider. Uh, I'm not sure entirely uh, internally how it uh, does that. But we could do that, and then we can mess with the um, with our radius, you know, bring it down, do things like that. But obviously, it's not quite right. Um, there is the edge collider. What does that do? Edge Collider is sort of there for platformers, where a it's kind of a one-sided collider. Assuming I'm remembering this correctly, things can sort of collide from the top, but not the bottom. It allows you to sort of jump through things from the bottom and then land on the top. I'm pretty sure is what the Edge Collider is there for. Uh, so that's not right. That leaves us with a Polygon Collider. Okay. Admittedly, this looks really weird. The thing is, by default, the Polygon Collider tries to detect the shape of your object and then tries to map some polygons to it. It clearly did a very poor job here. But the nice thing is you can modify these. If you hold shift, let me go and full screen this bad boy. If you hold shift, you actually get these sort of snapping points. And what you can do is you can drag these and reshape things. If you hold control, you get the red thing, which actually allows you to remove points. Now we're talking. Needs a little bit of manual uh, loving over here. A little bit of romancing to get where you might want it, but let's go ahead. And again, we'll make it slightly smaller than graphics, especially the, the edges here are sort of tr uh, transparent, translucent. It makes the graphics look better, but it doesn't feel like the solid edge of the uh, object. So is there some sort of like double line thing? It feels bizarre. No, okay, it's just thicker because of things. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll pull it back to somewhere around here. Uh, I do need an extra edge. So if I hold shift, I can create extra edges. And we'll sort of advance like that just a little bit. Oh, we do have an extra little bit over there. Maybe something like this. Again, I'm going to try to stay within the shape because uh, A, it'll make players happy. I'm actually, mm, mm, this is not what I want. There we go. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm accidentally scaling things here. We'll have to make an adjustment to that uh, very, very soon. Um, it makes players happy, but it also will actually make the game feel better. Uh, if I had changed, I should have done this first. Hang on. Let me go. Unmaximize. Make sure my scaling is set to 111 everywhere and then re-maximize this. Okay. If, so by default, you're usually on this move mode, this uh, tool right over here, which allows you to scale things and move things around. If you go to the hand tool, it still allows you to select objects, but it doesn't allow you to move them. And this is the safer way to do this sort of editing because we can still do the object editing from this mode, but then we don't have to worry about accidentally moving the object or scaling it, especially on the things with the edges like this. And there we go. So now we've got uh, a shape that looks better. It's a little hard to see, I realize, probably on YouTube, but I've, I've got an outline of this ship that looks much, much better. So that's the sort of thing I'm going to want to do. I'm going to want to do this for the enemies as well. So let's take one of these enemies, remove the box collider, and add the polygon collider. <laughs> you know, it's not wrong that uh, it's, it's relatively uh, pentagon shaped, which is interesting. Uh, and yeah, we're just going to sort of roughly get a shape that feels about right. Something like that. We might we might want to actually add more edges to this guy. Because the player will be disappointed if uh, his bullet hits the enemy and doesn't quite do the damage correctly. So I'm just holding shift to create some new control points. There we go. We'll do something like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this change. So that way it'll be applied back to the prefab, which will then also update these other enemies over here. So now we've all got pretty accurate colliders. Uh, the bullets are pretty square. I think the box collider on the bullet is perfectly fine. I think the shape is okay. It's so small that any little imperfection would not be noticeable. But now we have a much, much better hitbox uh, from the point of view of the player. Oh, these uh, things over here can change. Q, W, E, R allows you to cycle through all these, which is pretty handy. Move our ship down here. Let's go ahead and hit play. Should be a little bit easier for me to dodge these guys now because there's no weird overhang. Uh, there's no unexpected collision. That. Oh. I forgot to set is trigger. And is trigger. And apply. Let me do a test collision. Boom. There we go. All right. Good. Now we die. So. But now there's no weird overhangs that are unexpected little invisible collision boxes that I'm unhappy with. There we go. I can pass quite closely here, and it feels good. And when I do collide, yeah, it's like, no, that felt pretty legitimate. Uh, it was a little bit weird right now that the second guy, I didn't collide with him, but there should be some sort of visual symbol when I run into someone and I'm in my invulnerability period 
I should be blinking. And then it becomes really obvious that uh, I should not be getting shot at. Okay. Um, speaking of being shot at, let's go. What's my... Okay, my timer is way long, but I really want to have the enemies fight back. So, we're going to go ahead and add a new script. Uh, we've got player shooting. We're going to have enemy shooting. Create that. Open it. We're going to go real fast. Now, enemy shooting will be very similar to player shooting, to the point where there's going to be some copy pasta. So actually, almost all of it's going to be exactly the same. Copy all this, paste all that. What's different? Well, first of all, we don't care about the fire button. The fire delay makes a lot of sense. We'll make it a little bit slower for the enemies. Default to a half a second. Will that actually take effect over here? Yes. We're going to apply this so that the script exists on all the players. So now, every half second, they will shoot. Now, this will not damage us. Have you guessed why? Oh, well, first of all, you can see the errors. I forgot to assign a bullet prefab, so let's go ahead and do that. Bullet prefab, we're going to assign it and apply the changes to my prefab. Again, I could be dragging this stuff right onto my enemy prefab and save me a step, but I usually work sort of live and then see that. Anyway, moving on. What happened? Boom! They all died. It'll be really obvious in a second. Are they shooting? Step one. Yes. We can see here in the chat, four enemy pews, followed by a bunch of triggers. Have you figured it out yet? That's right, the enemies are killing themselves. So they are shooting, and the bullet, even though it's, it still has the offset, it's still offset by half a, a unit, is just enough, it's still technically overlapping the graphic. And the bullet prefab is on the player layer. And player layer and enemy layer intersect. So the bullet is instantly killing the enemy. So, one answer would be to give enough of an offset so that the bullet doesn't start off intersecting with the enemy, but that still means they're going to A, shoot each other, and B, it's not going to do any damage to me because players don't hit each other. The correct answer is to set the bullet to the right layer that the enemy is on. Now, what I could do is in my, my prefab, I can create another copy. I can make another bullet prefab, this one for enemies, and change the prefab's layer to enemy. That would work, and then use that. In fact, I probably will want different en bullets for the enemies than for the player. But, something else that will A, fix things for now, and B, sort of fix things long term, wouldn't it make more sense that when anything shot, it, it set the, uh, the, the layer of the bullet to the same layer as the person who shot it? That's excellent. So, in our enemy shooting, when we instantiate our bullet, we're going to grab a copy of the bullet uh, game object. Now, instantiate instantiate things that return an object as opposed to a game object, so we do have to do a little bit of a cast. You, if you ever get an error, and you'll see it here. Here, I'll get rid of this. I'll try to um, compile this. We'll get an error. Can't convert object to game object. And the reason is instantiate returns object, but it's actually a game object, so we can do a cast, and that works. And then our bullet game object, we're going to say bullet game object layer equals to our enemy, our current game object, layer. Now they'll have the same layer. They will no longer hit each other and they will now damage the player. There we go. And they're going to turn to face me and I actually got destroyed by the collision, but I was damaged first by the bullet. Boom, boom. There you go. Bullets killed me. Awesome. Awesome. And in fact, in my opinion, we should do the very same thing with the player. Uh, grab that. I guess I can just copy and paste the... Uh, first line as well. So now, let's say our bullet, let's say we didn't assign a layer to it at all. We just put it on default layer. Okay, our bullet prefab is now in the default layer. That's okay, because our player's bullets will automatically be moved to the player's layer and the other way around. Did it feel like I, I wasn't killing that guy properly? Is there something weird going on? They should have no invulnerability period. That was weird. Maybe maybe I was getting confused about all the bullets because they're all the same color. No! No, something happened there. How did they not die? All right, let's get rid of some of the spam. There is a bug. There is a bug, you guys. Okay, this video has gone on too long. I'll probably have to... Uh... And unlike my educational bugs, this is not one that I intended. That all worked. Is it... After I die? Doesn't make any sense. 
Yeah. What? It's like after I'm dead, they no longer trigger. That makes no... What? I'm confused. But we're going to have to wrap it up. Let me get rid of all the... Uh, the log spam. And I will give it a think. Or maybe we'll leave it in there as an interesting glitch. I'm not sure. Uh, let me see. What's our next part? We now have enemies that fight back. Collisions resolution. Death. Hit points. Invulnerability period. Wow, I'm actually ahead of schedule. So I guess the question now is uh, maybe respawning. Maybe an explosion graphic and some respawning. Something like that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that next time. That'll be, that'll be the game. Um, you guys can feel free to add in more details after that, scoring and whatnot, but next episode will simply involve getting our ship to come back to life after it dies. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.